for tuning in to Power Athlete Radio. Back by popular demand, the crew infotains you on subject matter that they know best. Movement, performance, movies, nutrition, movies, and barbecue. Luke and Tex chat with remote Power Athlete HQ crew, Leah Kay and Tyler Minton. To recap the recent MMA fight of Megan Anderson, the games, and tackle your questions. When your rig breaks down at the games, you make shit happen. And when you make shit happen, you meet crazy tow truck drivers who claim to have killed three men. This is the normal life of the Power Athlete HQ crew. Find out what the deal is with leaky gut, why you need a form lifting collar, and how to make your arms longer. That's right, a recipe of farmer carries and beating wholesale ass will increase your reach by 40% according to no research. This episode, sit back, relax, and take in the nutrition and training knowledge that gets you through a weekend of mowing the lawns and trips to Bed Bath & Beyond. Or try Power Athlete Radio as the perfect conversation starter at your next summer barbecue. This is episode 167. Power Athlete Nation, what is up? You've got Luke and Tex here in SoCal, sweating it out in an 87 degree office. You've got Leia K reporting in from Texas. And Tyler, I don't know where you're at. Where are you now? I'm in Kansas City. And Tyler's in the, the Paris of the Midwest, Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City? Where the beer flows like wine. <laughs> but uh, you know, listen to Power Athlete Radio, also known as the world's premier podcast in strength and conditioning, which, again, I will reiterate, was reiterated to us by third parties at the CrossFit Games, which is going to be one of our discussion topics today. So, um, I don't know, uh, Leo, what's going on? Let's start with you. What, do you, what have you been up to? Um, well, we just got back from the games this earlier this week. So back into the grind at the gym, uh, we had a really big benefit for one of our athletes today. Uh, one of our coach's husbands got in a diving accident over July third, July 4th weekend. Um, he broke his neck. He is in the hospital recovering though, and it's looking really promising. So we had a huge turnout for benefit wad for them this morning. It was really cool. Uh, it's, I mean, shitty situation, but it's awesome when, you know, you tap into the community and especially when you've cultivated in your gym to all come together and fucking help, help a fellow member in need, you know? Yeah, we've raised over $60,000 for them total. And um, they're just, everything's looking really, really good. So I was really proud of everybody today. Awesome. And then, uh, dude, Tyler, update. If anybody hasn't been following our Snapchat, Tyler and uh, Megan, who was also on Power at the Radio a few weeks ago, or a couple months ago, I guess, uh, they had a fight last night, fight night, and it is gnarly, dude. Tyler's sending us pictures. Fuck, dude. Yeah. Yeah, Megan half killed a girl. I, that, I had to break her cheek. There's really no way a cheek looks like that from anything other than a broken bone. Well, dude, give us a rundown, okay? So, like, first off, I think people, if they haven't listened to your podcast, which, we, like, was in the vault for a fucking year, uh, <laughs> and, and by the vault, I mean, I forgot about it, and then Tyler's like, dude, what about that podcast? But, um, so what What were you doing out with me? And, like, what, you know, talk about what you do with your fighters and shit like that, and then where was her mindset, and then how did it fucking go down? Yeah, so, like, you know, if they listen to the last one, they'll know that I do nutrition for a lot of fighters, and, and part of that is the weight cut. Um, she's six foot, 165 pounds with a six pack. So her weight cuts are very, very tricky. In fact, I mean, she, she gets up to like 170 even and, and is still really lean. Um, so our weight cuts are, are really tricky and we had to make sure that she does it correctly. Interestingly enough, in her last fight, she still wasn't necessarily like, comfortable eating the amount of carbs she should eat in this fight um we started her off we started off where i ended up getting her to leave off last time and then she was having some issues um with her training like like just not feeling great and all that um upped her carbs a bit consulted with leia a bit you know being a chick that helps um with chick like things uh consulted leia a bit upped them and, like, she dropped, like, three pounds in a week, like, immediately and, and felt better. Did some things to increase the uh, palatability of her food, just where she was training so much and the food she just she really wasn't wanting to eat. But the weight cut went really well. Um, uh, I 
session in the hot tub, and the next day just did some some bathtubs, uh, just soaked the bathtub hot water, um, got it all off, went in. They did a, an early weigh-ins, which is really cool. Uh, the UFC is doing it now as well, so they can actually weigh in at 10 a.m. and they have all the way from 10 a.m. the day before till five time to put on weight. And if you look at the weigh-in pictures, these were done after they've already put on weight. And Megan does not look like she weighs 146. I mean, she's easily 160, 165 again. Um, you know, only eight, nine hours later. I mean, just just massive. Um, Anyway, yeah, I mean, so she, she did really good through that. Goes into the fight and just absolutely destroys the girl. It was it was a, a pretty brutal thing to watch. So talk like to we, us about um, – sorry. Well, so I was going to say, like, when you have no emotional connection to the opponent, like, you don't really care. You have no – but you still feel bad for them. You know, it's like, you know it's bad. <laughs> yeah, that's where, like, I think I'm too sympathetic – like, I watched that girl get popped when you, I was watching the Snapchats, you know? And I'm like, ooh, like, god damn, this poor fucking girl. But it's like, oh, they, yeah. like they, they, they will toe up in the ring. It's like, they know what they're getting into, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's part of it. And that's, I mean, I think Megan sent her last three girls to the emergency room. So, I mean, I, I feel like if you accept the fight with her, you just got to know it's probably, it, it's a good chance. So talk to us about uh, carbohydrates and preparation, because you never know if a fight is going to last 15 seconds or three rounds. So how do you prepare your athletes for the energy demands that you don't necessarily know? Yeah, well, you, you have to prepare for the worst-case scenario. And, and any fighter who's been in a, you know, a, a three-round or a championship round, a five-round fight, can tell you that is the worst possible scenario. It's exhausting. You know, it's not just 15 minutes. I think a lot of people think – when they think 15 minutes, they think of the worst. We'll, we'll go back to fight gone bad because I'm very vocal about how, how freaking bad that workout sucks. Not because it's hard. It sucks because it just sucks. It's a bunch of stupid movements that have no relation to actual fighting, and we put a catchy, sexy term on it. Um, like, they do things like that, and they think that that represents what 15 minutes of a fight must feel like, and it's, it's just it's nowhere close. Um, you know, nothing can, can really mimic the demands of 15 minutes of constantly moving, going up and down, heart rate spiking, heart rate dropping, adrenaline rush, adrenaline dump, um, injury. I mean, it, it's weird. You simultaneously taste blood. You can smell blood. It's it's the weirdest, most sensory, you know, it, it's, it's just an unreal experience. Yeah, it's, um, it's a hard state to replicate in training, right? Unless yeah, you, yeah. You know, so you smash in the face by, you know, like a, a large trout you got. Well, this is where sports-specific training comes in. Exactly. And this they is hire this, Tyler to punch you in the face during your workouts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is – Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the thing. It's like, well, I'm going to have you do some of the top holds, and I'm going to kick you in the face while you're doing them. That would make this a little bit Sign more like a fight. Uh, it's a little bit more like fight gone bad. Um, but, no, you, you have to prepare as if the fight's going to be 15 minutes, every ounce of energy that you possibly have to give. Um, so the, you get all these fighters that just want to go super low carb. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes they want to be a little bit high protein. Uh, Megan tends to want to be more of a high protein. I think it comes from being from where she's from in Australia, and it's kind of a – superficial area where people walk around and have naked a lot. It's by the beach. Hot protein diets are more of a bodybuilder way of thinking. So I think a lot of it comes from that. Um, so you get a lot of that and, and just a lot of them in general. They want to be really low carb because they're so used to low carb is how you lose weight. And the problem with the MMA world is you have a lot of sport coaches trying to also be strength coaches and it's just they're not qualified. Um, so there, and you know, so that, that there's that uh, lack of communication there. So they're having these guys just do whatever it is to lose weight. I, I just need you to lose weight. You have to make the weight class. And what I try to get all these guys and, and, and gals thinking, it's like if, if you feel terrible, if your weight cut's terrible, if you don't have the energy to fight, then what's the purpose of ever doing it? Like, it's just don't fight. It's, it's go up a weight class, do something. Your goal should not be to make weight. Your goal should be to perform amazing and you're just going to make weight on the road to that. Um, so just as if I was preparing someone for 
an ultra marathon, a, um, you know, a, a soccer game, a football game. I mean, anything, um, you know, you have to have carbs to perform. You're just not going to perform in an anaerobic activity without a pretty good dense amount of carbs. So we keep that. We, we carb them up as much as we can and then just do some uh, electrolytes. Um, I want to use, uh, let's say, like electrolyte manipulations and things like that to get their body to drop the weight through water without any exertion or, you know, anything like that whatsoever. So they have plenty of energy when it's ready to fight. So maybe this is a good segue for our man who's trying to cut 15 pounds in three weeks. So Tex, can you pull up that question for us? On it. <clears throat> Stand by. This is from Brian Nielsen. Let's say you have three weeks to try and drop 15-ish pounds for a weightlifting meet. What's the best way to go about that without sacrificing energy levels and performance? Well, I guess the energy levels for a weightlifting meet are not like very demanding of carbs. What do you, have you ever done a weightlifting meet? Yeah. I mean, that's six lifts. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, that's well six too many. <laughs> but Tyler, so jump in on this. Yeah, so you, you already hit the major part just from, you know, the, the energy demands. We know that it's not a glucose-requiring activity. Uh, we don't need to, to pound that in. So there's things we can do. I would, like, it's one of those where I would need to have a lot more information just because they're all different. The difference in a 24-hour weigh-in, a 12-hour weigh-in, and an hour weigh-in are all vastly different. And the what it takes to do that starts now. I mean, you got three weeks. Um, it can make some, it, it can go down to some serious diet changes. It could be something where we don't really have to change anything till the week of, or it could be something where we just do it the night before. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with people who have done all those, those different scenarios too. Um, so it is something I, I, I need to know. And if he's listening, I mean, he can email me at tower at power at the um, We can dive a little bit further into that, but um, you know, just to, to still give him a bit of an answer, it's, it's going to take some form of a, of a dietary change without knowing some more detail. It's hard to really say how we would make those changes and when we would start making them. But, it's 15 pounds is doable though. Yeah. Tyler? Yeah. Sorry, you're, you're cutting out just a little bit. But oh. 15 pounds is doable? Yeah, 15 pounds is super doable. That's not a uh, – what, what if they only weigh like 150 pounds? Um, depending on their weight, 15 pounds, as their weight goes down, the amount of weight they need to cut gets a, well, little, a little bit trickier. Check it, out, check it out, Brian's Instagram here. I'm stalking you a little bit, bro. Uh, he's more than 150. So <laughs> I think we're going to be all right. Yeah. I mean, you're talking 200, 200 plus pounds. Yeah. 15, 15 pounds is, is an easy cut. I'll tell you if this was one of, if, if one of my UFC guys had 15 pounds to cut and they were a middleweight, we'll say welterweight all the way to heavyweight. They only had 15 pounds to cut. Shoot. Even my lightweights, 15 pounds to cut three weeks out. They would be, they would be ecstatic. They get a twenty-four hour weigh-in. I mean, put it this way: Megan, Megan has to weigh one forty-six. She weighed one fifty-nine three weeks out from her fight. All right. For, like, and we, I had her like, I was like, you need to go eat a lot of sushi because that's way too hot right now. Word. So. All right. So there you go, dude. Fucking, it, it matters. Be money, and you got to hit us up to figure out the deets. Uh, Tex, what's our next question? Uh, this one just came in from our boy, Greg Boyd. What's the age limit for wearing grab-ass hats backwards? I think this is a, uh, a jab at us, Luke. What's a grab-ass hat? The hats that we wear. No, those are called like trucker hats or something, aren't they? Well, I guess he calls them grab-ass hats. I don't understand why they're called grab-ass. Anyways, barrel forward. That's the question. That's the question. The age cutoff is... Uh, probably, I don't know, 15, 15, <laughs> but I don't fucking follow the rules, dude. You know, <laughs> that. I, I live my life a quarter mile a time. <laughs> well, that can lead us into another question. That guy I'll start, I'll start wearing my hat forward when I start like tucking my t-shirts into my blue jeans with a belt. 
I, dude, I was just talking to John about that, and I think I'm going to transition to tucking my T-shirt in. Why? Why? Because it, you know, it makes me look old, like older. I can people take me seriously. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's that Bieber quamp that you comb across your hair or your forehead. That I started that, this. You started this, yeah, and then stole Bieber it. stole it. Get Absolutely. out of here! Well, I can pull up my high school photos, and you'll see. Evolution. All right. So this this is another fun one we got here. This is from Go Oakland. Totally appreciate your movie appreciation. It's appreciated. Have you ever considered Fast and Furious is just a cheap ripoff of Point Break? Switch the cars for surfing, and it's the exact same plot. Undercover FBI turns into bromance with a guy he's trying to bring in, all while falling in love with a girl associated with a group of criminals. That being said... Uh, text can't pronounce this. That being said, is Bell's bigger than Waimea? It's a fucking 50-year storm. And yeah, it's been considered. And yeah, there's a reason why both those fucking movies are sick. Now, where did the Fast and Furious go right? They made eight more. Where did Point Break go wrong? They tried to remake the original. But that's what? not on Point Break. That's on, that's on Hollywood. No, no, no. Listen, they're all the same. Whoever they are, they did it wrong. But we had this conversation no, before. They could have called it Breaking Point. Yeah. Right, and then it would have been the exact same plot of the remake, but mm -hmm. then they just changed the names. And honestly, I think we would have loved the movie. Well, I, yeah, sure, I'm in. A, I still love the movie, but here's the reality behind this, you guys. Seriously, it's all about ha being having a global awareness and being a nonlinear thinker. See, like Point Break just wanted to hit the credits and put down, like, make a splash. You get it? Okay. But the fast and the the brilliance behind Vin Diesel and his Fast and Furious franchise. They knew they could get away with like nine more movies because you've always got one more job. You know what I mean? You can always do one last job. That's why you don't kill off people, bro. But Bodhi didn't die. So here's another theory. Okay, here we go. All of Swayze's characters are connected. Mm -hmm. Let's think about this for a minute. Go on. So Wolverines. What happened to the older brother? He hit the road. So after they freaking defeated the enemies, he hit the road. And guess what? He travels around. We're talking about Red Dawn, people. If yeah, you haven't seen it, check it out. So he travels around the United States just in a beat-up freaking, freaking two-door mm -hmm. and starts bouncing at bars. Nobody knows his name. A legend starts up about him. The name's Dalton. The name's Dalton. Mm -hmm. Thought you'd be bigger, right? He's a cooler. And then what happened next? And what happened to Dalton? Ripped the throat out, went off, went off the grid. Then went Got off the, girl. the grid, and then what did he become? A surfer, big a brother? A surfer on the loose. And then it's not confirmed whether he died in the in the freaking the greatest storm ever. The 50-year storm? The 50-year storm. Maybe he, had, he survived this monumental uh, just opportunity, and then he started to go straight and narrow. And guess what? He changes his name, gets a decent job, meets Demi Moore, <laughs> tries to do some good, and that's when he died. So you're saying that he... every single Patrick Swayze movie is connected. Okay. That's what I'm saying. I Ooh. think that is also fact. <laughs> when did he go to camp and dance with uh, Put Baby in the Corner? Well, that was, that was let's see, that was right before college. So that was pre-Red Dawn. Oh, okay. Oh, so okay. I know you know this. Timeline. Yeah, it was the summer, uh, you know, one of his college years, right? He was That's... making money before. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Good nobody... point, Leah. You know, Leah's here to... to, to Ensure the integrity of this timeline text because I think we have something going on. So the answer to who asked it again? Go Oakland. Go Oakland. The answer is, yeah, it's being considered, and I think it's brilliant. Well, all I'm saying is that all the Fast and Furiouses, they just stole all of Swayze's movies. What is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. And exactly. That's why enjoy it so much. <laughs> uh, should, we, should we get into games, games coverage? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Is there a question specifically on it? No, but we got a lot to talk about. All right, sounds good. Because we had a lot of fun time. All right, yeah, so Tyler, Tyler, you were watching from afar, but Leia K, I uh, texted myself, we're actually at ground zero uh, cheering on some teams. We saw fucking Luke Espy and his team crush it. Uh, crush it. Dude, at, like hit second place. That's fucking awesome on those guys. So, um, I, I mean, I met – how long ago did you meet, Luke? Because you, you're out in that area. Yeah, 2012, pre-Occupy Strength. Yeah. And then uh, I worked a couple starts with him. He helped us out with uh, the team series after that, or I guess it was Occupy Strength. And I forget well, what event was in Miami. Well, we all competed. 
yeah, we all competed at Occupy Strength in Baltimore, and that was the greatest competition of all time. Mm -hmm. Questionable scoring. Questionable scoring, CrossFit <laughs> did not, never forget. <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, the uh, Ryan, 12 Labors coach, he has put just a, a freaking mission in place, and they've been building a community, which then has led to a team. So mm -hmm. I think we're seeing a lot of teams try to like buy players, like the freaking Miami Heat back in the day. And now they, they organically grew this, this, this team in 12 labors. And then over the years, you see them go from uh, regionals competitors into making the games. And then they've just been ticking up the leaderboard ever since every year. So it was a great, great just kind of a way to watch and spectate. For sure, yeah. And then, uh, I mean, what about your limiting factors article? Oh, yeah. So we got a lot there. So uh, we had an athlete there, Christy Adkins. And so I was watching all of not only – uh, her compete, but her competitors compete and seeing where like she could get an edge, kind of breaking down the war the workouts so we can prepare with her warm up, get her dialed in. Uh, I met with her coach before some of the events and sat down and then watched watched a couple with him. Uh, so it was a different perspective than we are used to. We used to have a booth there. This time we went Sands booth and just kind of kind of kicked it and it worked a little bit and then observed. Uh, so just uh, five quick hitting points that I. Viewed, and we talked about while we're watching these these girls suffer. Uh, vertical pull, muscle actions. Girls failed at the eccentric and the isometric holds. Uh, in in majority of these these pulls or upper body movements, and if you look at their training, there's not a lot of that. Uh, so where if you see Chrissy Atkins, she succeeded. We did our manual resistant pull up protocol, had her on that once a week, and then she finishes fifth in the event. So it's not by practicing the pegboard; it's by attacking you know, just the actions necessary to do the movement, and then she's prepared to do anything and everything. Uh, second thing, when we saw the step-ups, any time an athlete had to step up, it just looked horrendous. Mm -hmm. So whether that's jumping up into a box, whether that's attacking the snail, the slug, whatever you want to call it, and then what we hear about the trail run. Unfortunately, we couldn't watch it. But you got to get your knees up, and then we saw a freaking a lot of uh, broken fib, mm -hmm. uh, Torn, torn plantar fascia plant plantar fascia and then freaking a ankle issues up a lot of people um and then that led to kind of trunk trunk issues so trunk stability that was for the elephants that were competing right yeah trunk the ele uh no the back of the car um, <laughs> yeah foot position weak weak ass trunk no tensile strengths failed step up and then again piss poor sprinting running mechanics and sprinting with it factored into about five or six events mm -hmm. and it became definitely a, a limiting factor, but then an X factor for badass athletes like Christy. Uh, so it was, uh, it was fun to watch at the same time. We're like, Oh my God, there's so much more that we can do for people. Um, but Leia, you had an opportunity to now observe you were a former CrossFit games athletes. What was your take on some of the events? Well, I, I think that it was interesting that, we did, like you were saying, we saw the pegboard again, and you could see where the failure um, came out for a lot of those athletes, females. Some of the males even really couldn't handle it. And like you said before, they can do, you know, a million kipping pull-ups. But um, the, the rope this year, they had a, in some of the rope events, it was a short rope. So they had to legless up until they could get their feet on. Um, and that proved to be some of the issues for people as well, that vertical pull. Um, and then the sprinting was interesting because the guy that won the sprint, Roy Yambo, he's from Texas. Uh, he's a former football player, and he had amazing turns whenever he would go around those little dummies, and he crushed people in that. Um, so it was a lot of fun to watch this year. I thought the, the programming was, was pretty interesting. I liked some of the team events. I liked the slug. It looked really fucking heavy. Um, but definitely – you know, prove some points where there's, there's holes in people's games that they're just not focusing on. I think a lot of CrossFit athletes think that if they just do CrossFit, they're going to get better. Like I'm just going to keep doing these different Metcons or whatever. Um, and they really got to start breaking down some of those primal movements and, and strengthening up some of those holes that don't have anything to do with doing the actual workout. It's the movements. So yeah, you I was, really hit it on that. I was excited to see the, the snail, the slug, what are we calling it? Um, it's, it's the snail. It's got a, it's a snail. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway, so we had those at university of Texas and it was awesome to see those come into play. And the objective at Texas was you start at the beginning of your summer program, five yards away. 
right? So you're five yards, you have that opportunity to gain some momentum, some punch, and then attack that thing. And what they did was just push it as long as they could maintain speed. So it wasn't a slow and grinding thing. Uh, goal is basically maintain, you know, a, a freaking special capacity, endurance, whatever you want to call it, for pop and power. And then when the coach saw you slow down, they just whistle you off or what? Yeah. yeah. But guys were giving everything, and it was yeah. not necessarily a need to whistle. Yeah. So, um, and then over the eight weeks, guess what they did? They went from five yards to four yards to three yards to one yards, which is, you know, the football line. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to maintain the momentum, the pop, but just decrease the amount of time that you have to call upon that force. So awesome, awesome thing that we got to see uh, or I got to observe for the first time in college, and now I'm seeing this thing again. And we got a whole different athlete attacking this, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm freaking having a heart attack, anxious over there because it's just not as good as it should be. But, again, guess what it is? It's freaking – it's like a prowler push. you got to extend your arms. you got to get locked down your trunk, and there can be zero rotation, zero twist and turn, and then based off the big screen, that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Freaking, uh, you know, the old wet noodle model mm -hmm. all over the place. And that wet noodle is the inability to – Maintain tension in the trunk while your hips move through that Z axis, right? Yeah. So the economy of movement, bro, that's what I'll tell you what, after a belly full of barbecue and a couple beers, I come up with some pretty good concepts, don't I? Yeah. And analogies <laughs> and analogy King. Uh, I, c I can't take credit for it, but uh, Luke, Luke is the, the author of movement is an athlete's currency and fundamentals are checks. They cash come competition time. That's what I do. I'm, I'm a, poetic motherfucker but now let me tell you about the height the, the crossfit games just like any competitor has a, their highs and their low points oh through the God. competition so do the spectators because tex and i were out there fucking baking in the sun it was hot leo wasn't it i mean it was like it was real hot it, it just fucking and, and i was wearing black vans so like the heat in my feet was just fucking like swelling up and blistering the bottom of my feet Anyways, what do we do? We wanted to fuck off early, like at like we, we popped out, missed the men's event. No, no, no. So we we got there early. So we were there for all of Christie's events. So they had a seven a.m. Murph while well, we were there at six thirty. Uh, so then they just the scheduling. It was random announcements of individual shits. So we're like, all right, we'll go early. They'll probably end individuals early as well, and we'll leave. But then they just kept on scheduling individual events. So we were like, ah, fuck it, we'll just stay. Mm -hmm. So we stayed till uh, girls finished up their final event at like 6.30 or something on, yeah. was it Friday? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we were going to leave early, but then we're like, nah, we'll hang out. And then we, wh where were we going to roll? We, we had something in mind, like we're going to get a tacos or something. We were going to get creative. Yeah, so we're going to get tacos. Us, I mean, tacos. <laughs> Sit cider. around the fire. Sit around the fire pit. Have some ciders. Maybe and a margarita. And solve the world's problems. Yeah, yeah. We had problems to solve. We had programming to do. It was like they, we were ready to go home and be productive for the next three or four hours. So much so that before I exited the venue, I ripped off my my entry band. I'm like fuck this, I'm out of here. And then we get to the fucking big rig, aka the egg rig, aka Iggy, which is the dually that we fucking rolled up in, which is uh, one of John's projects right now. Runs great. Everything's fine until you leave the lights on while you're parked at the CrossFit Games and lock the doors so no one can fucking turn them off. Because, Leah, you saw it on, right? Yeah. Like so, the funniest shit about that story, right? We parked. We got there way later than y'all walking across the parking lot because they they didn't have this the vendor village in the same place they had last year. So, we were parked in fucking Timbuktu. I had to walk a mile to the stadium. And we're walking past the parking lot, and Neil looks over, and he's like, man, that's a sweet-ass dually, but they left their lights on. I didn't even see it. <laughs> Just walk on by, and then we come to find out that it was you guys. Well, we had a Wade's Army sticker on there. You didn't see that? No, we were across the parking lot. He just ah. saw the edge of it in the front. He's like, that dually's got its lights on. Well, anyways, here – <laughs> here's here's i'm gonna just fast track the story because people are like what the fuck so the battery's dead we see some cats that we met um that follow field strong follow power athlete and these two are the nicest ben and bridge and they work for raw living foods and they do some like uh meal planning stuff and they ship you fresh food and shit like that anyways they're talking we so we sat there we talked about programming with them for like 20 minutes at the games during the team events yeah and uh basically I'm like, fuck, battery's dead. We need to jump. And we look over, we see them in this big ass truck. And we're like, fuck yeah, Tex, get out and go. So Tex pops off, sprints over, perfect arm swing, perfect dive, perfect drive, 
but uh, you know, stumbles up a little bit on the change of direction. I'm not gonna what? I'm not. I mean, I'm not gonna go into depth about what happened. But we get then <laughs> bridge it over, and uh, we try to fucking jump this truck. And like, honestly, I don't know the inner workings of the, the vehicle. It's a it's a non aspirated diesel 1986 uh, cargo utility vehicle. Twenty miles a gallon. Twenty right? miles a gallon, right? But anyways. Apparently, this is a 24-volt system, and we tried to jump it with a 12, and we did not do it correctly. So any fucking car geeks out there are going to be like, oh, what the fuck? Uh, you guys are idiots. Well, yeah, okay, yes. listen, I'm an idiot. I take that. I'm not offended by that, that fact. But um, so we fucking – we try to jump it. Boom. We blow a, sol a solenoid in the system, and the starter won't kick off. So then we drain out whatever charge we put into the battery on accident because we're retarded, okay, or stupid. And uh, then we're like, all right, well, let's just, you got jumper cables, let's use your jumper cables. Well, the solenoid's blown, so there's constant uh, current going into the starter, even with the key out of the ignition. So when we jump, throw the jumper cables on, we fucking fry the jumper cables and literally melt the cables off of the fucking truck. And it's like a billion degrees. There's sparks flying everywhere. We're lucky the battery didn't explode. We get battery acid in our eyes and our face. And next thing you know, we're like fucking Dark Man starring Liam Neeson, right? So what happens? You call AAA. Text. You have AAA? Text. What was your answer? Yeah, I got AAA. So we called his AAA to get a fucking tow. The guy shows up like an hour and a half later, and I'm telling AAA, we got a big rig here. This is a big rig. It's a dual rear axle. We need the biggest flatbed you have. So what do they do with the tow truck company? They don't tell them a fucking thing. And they bring this little putt-putt tow truck that could maybe pull a fucking go-kart. I mean, am I wrong? Uh, well, we... Listen, that's the, let's just go with that as a fact. Okay. <laughs> and our guy, Golf, who is our tow truck driver, oh who lives in augmented reality because he has no clue what's going on, no. but a very cool fucking guy, I well, thought. He, well, as soon as he told us the story where he shot three people in the 85 Vons freaking riots yeah whatever like uh, yeah he's, i'm gonna be nice to this guy yeah. but uh so he's like listen man i can't do it i can't do it can't tow it he's like but i'm gonna make it happen so he fucking tries to put this thing on the flatbed and like the wheels are off the side it's crooked and shit and he's like no i can't do it calls another tow truck which is like the one they use to tow ambulances and shit right that tow truck comes out and that guy's like fuck this i'm not towing this and, and boy golf is like dude i'll take your truck you take mine back to the headquarters bing bang boom and we load that sucker up. Now, here's an important detail, okay? At this time, we tried to leave at 6.15, 6.30. It is now 11.30 p.m. We haven't eaten. We haven't had any water. We've maybe had a Modelo. Well, for, for uh, Ben and Bridge's sake, they, they fed us a little bit. Yeah, Some but journeys. Ben and Bridge, who are fucking super responsible and super nice and come prepared, unlike Tex and I, they had like a little snack pack for us. Well, they're parents. They got yeah. And they, so snacks. they stayed with us literally all fucking five hours to hang out and uh, like make sure we got off all right. And they're the nicest fucking people in the world. But we're like, dude, you're going to be a part of a great story. Now, we finally get this thing rolled up and we're driving back to fucking uh, Power at the HQ with this big rig on the back. This dude is telling us all sorts of crazy stories. He's like, bro, you wouldn't believe what we see in Carson as tow truck drivers. It's like they don't fucking go and like get no parking cars and tow them out. It's like they get called into these fucking pileups and these accidents. And he's telling us about all this fucking gnarly shit he saw where he had to go fucking tow a car that randomly flipped somehow in the middle of the freeway. Dude got thrown out of the fucking car, right? Yeah. I mean, he got vertical. catapulted he out of this vertical. car and he went vertical. And I shit you not, this is what my boy Golf was saying. He's like, dude, this motherfucker hit an overpass exit sign. So like, you know the signs, like what happened? I'm like, dude, you're fucking full of shit. I'm like, that I know you're lying. Deadpool. I'm like, that's what happened in Deadpool. You just saw Deadpool and you're claiming this is reality. He's like, no bro, look it up on YouTube. So what did I do? Looked it up on well, YouTube. First off, Luke's phone was dead. <laughs> oh, that's a whole thing. Yeah, that Luke every forgot. phone, every phone we had was dead. And fortunately, <laughs> I got uh, like ten percent from Ben and Bridge. So my phone's on its way down. And what do I decide to do? Call bullshit on golf, and then wasting battery to look this shit up. But it was real. Yeah. So th since that was a fact, every story he told us before that was true. And after oh, this guy's crazy. Yeah. But anyways, long story longer. Uh, we ended up getting home like one a.m. We tried to leave at fucking six o'clock. So it was a five hour five hour ordeal. Uh, four of which our, our friends over at Raw Living Food were, were fucking right there by our side. Yeah, fortunately, individual events on Saturday started around 
of round one, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we were able to make it there for that, which was the snail mm -hmm. sprint jump. Yeah, all because Leia and Neil just wouldn't fucking give us a little heads up that the lights were on. Hey, I you mean... You had to have known. I didn't... I mean, based off I, John's, you know, passion. I've seen the Instagram. Here's the problem. I'm not the most observant person in the world. <laughs> I've told this many times. So I'm walking. I kind of glance to the side. Oh, yeah, there's a truck. Oh, it's got lights on. Cool. Whereas Neil is a very observant person. If he had Instagram, which I'm trying to get him into the 21st century, that would be helpful because maybe he would have recognized it. But whatever. I feel like you guys needed an adventure. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was telling Luke. He was all down and out. I'm like, no. We got we got podcast material. Yeah, no. Listen, in Texas, like you're so negative. What you and John don't understand <laughs> is that every story requires balance, and I will be the optimist or the pessimist depending on who I'm with. <laughs> <laughs> How is that wrong? How am I? Well, you, you, I we've, guess, we've been in multiple fucking scenarios. I guess then in our scenario, you're always the the, the negative. <laughs> no, dude, not not in Oktoberfest. How are you? You were the only positive because I was nowhere to be found. Exactly. So I'm like, well, Texas isn't a bad fucking place. So I'm going to just stay positive. <laughs> okay. Or in fucking South Africa. So we got that going on. Anyways, let's get back. Let's fucking talk like valuable shit now. Um, why don't we go? I got one more, one more final thing with the games. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was happy to see. Uh, so what we saw was a lot of Praxis. So I saw this in the the weighted jump rope. So that's when they had implements that people have never done before, but they had the tools to do so. So we saw the athletes come out. So uh, they were ability to take their anticipatory tuners, their execution of previous jump roping, and then apply that to the weighted jumps. Uh, we also saw the people that have done field sports before just really take over the change of direction stuff. So a lot of uh, new, interesting implements in there that challenge an athlete's ability to execute and do their movements. So good on the games for that. I was just very disappointed for the teams, and I didn't see the egg toss. <laughs> but you saw it in fucking what we do, <laughs> Jim. Yeah. Oh, that, that's another exciting thing we got going on. But um, and what's, yeah, and, and just about that stuff too. What's pretty cool is we, if you, I guess here's a shameless plug. If you haven't watched the Talk to Me Johnny Live stuff that we've been putting out, you are so far behind it. And I know you probably, listen, I know those people are out there like, I can't just sit in front of YouTube. Why don't you make it a podcast? Listen, because I'm, I am going to make it a podcast. Just give me a, give me a couple days to, you know, recharge my batteries and get, figure out how I set this one up. But, um, get on there. Cause we, we ended up having a lot of good talks with uh, Freddie and China. And then before and after we filmed that too, uh, you know, in anticipation for these events, uh, we are going to be, uh, really digging in our our uh, our sprint and and run and uh run prep with china because she's a swimmer and she doesn't she has those swimming habits programmed carried over to her run and that's what's causing some performance deficiencies in there so we're excited to work with her and get her up and running <laughs> on our uh, power athlete sprint stuff yeah so. yeah and I mean, we see the same carryover that now a lot of field sports or CrossFitters get into the pool. They can't quite figure it out. Now imagine that frustration on her side of things where she's a great swimmer, but then has to learn how to run. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, let's go. Let's go with the leaky gut one. Okay. Uh, Which I think is just like a little one liner. It's like, what are your thoughts on helping leaky gut? Yeah, I think that, yeah. Um, I'll go with that one, guys. So leaky gut is kind of, the thing about leaky gut is it's really kind of a broad term. Um, we're seeing it a lot more in as far as on like the medical side of things. A lot of functional medicine docs are dealing with leaky gut. Pretty sure John uh, wrote about it in his magnesium deficiency article not too long ago. But Anybody that doesn't know leaky guts, the idea that your basically your digestive tract has a bunch of little um, openings where your food digests, and those openings are supposed to they're supposed to open and close appropriately. And when you you can run into some issues depending on types of foods that you're eating, reactivity where the little openings get damaged. Um, and so instead of opening and closing like a like a door maybe with a key 
they're just hanging open. And when that happens, you get a lot of uh, leakage basically of, of it can be toxins, improperly digested food into the bloodstream uh, beyond the digestive tract and then your immune system can kind of go haywire. A uh, big problem with that, you know, power athlete nutrition, what's the one of the biggest, most important things is to safeguard the immune system. So anybody that thinks they're suffering from leaky gut, there's a couple of basic things you can do. Um, you know, really getting one of us or, or, you know, myself or to work on your diet specifics can help a lot. But as far as just basic help, probiotic type foods um, are going to be really important. You got to take out the, the shit that you're eating that is causing the problem. And there's a lot of different ways you can figure that out. And then we got to pump back the, the gut full of those healthy uh, probiotic type foods and nutrients to help uh, kind of seal that up again. There's supplements and stuff you can do too, but that's, that gets really in depth with, you know, your particular issues. But I think a lot of athletes suffer from uh, gut issues, especially if you're not you know, taking enough rest days, maybe you don't sleep quite enough, that can all come back and, and uh, bite you. And what, what would be some symptoms like for a hard charger that maybe like, how, how would they know if it's their gut that might be affecting how they perform? Um, well, the obvious ones are you can have digestive issues, you know, you can get like um, constipation, diarrhea, things like that. But there's a lot of not so obvious symptoms that people can have, um, like more kind of, you can have issues with like joint inflammation, more aches and pains. You can have, um, issues with getting sick a lot. Uh, if you're, you know, your, your immune system isn't, if your immune system is working so hard to deal with the shit that's going on in your digestive tract, it's not going to be able to really, um, work to, to keep you from getting like, you know, colds or, or, uh, things like that. Um, and nobody's immune. Uh, <laughs> the, you think that you're bulletproof really a lot of these athletes, especially the young guns going crazy, but, but, um, there's a lot of, you can do a lot of damage in a short period of time. If you don't, if you don't really take care of yourself, proper nutrition, proper recovery, but those are some symptoms that people can have. And then if you go deep, deep, deep down, you can, you can do like if you do any testing and stuff and notice you got a lot of deficiencies, like John had wrote about nutrient deficiencies, that definitely can point to. There's some specifics in blood testing that can point to leaky gut. So Nice. And, you know, that I mean, this will be kind of a segue for another question, but that's the reason it's at the bottom of the pyramid when we talk about building a power athlete, right? So how we just kind of like many other uh, – methodologies out there both inside and outside of strength and conditioning whether you're talking about like core business values or fucking <clears throat> how to fucking be in the best shape of your life or how to be as athletic as possible a lot of people use a pyramid or a triangle to uh, to depict kind of how the whole thing lays out and at the base of our pyramid for power athlete is nutrition because without it we can't effectively drive which is a fundamental accelerated adaptation, which is a fundamental principle in any training that we do, right? So it's like, listen, we're going to do the most amount of training that we can to drive the most amount of adaptation in the shortest period of time. And if you're not doing that, then you're not following the power athlete methodology, right? So that's where it, we talk about this is at our CrossFit football seminar. And we have a, a little question comment here. So text, where are we at? It's from James Harbolt. <clears throat> Love and appreciate what y'all do. Oh, thank I'll, you. I will be attending the CrossFit football seminar in Philly in October. I would like to become a certified CrossFit football coach, but will not be able to complete the CrossFit level one before then. Is there a way to retroactively submit that, or should I wait until I have my level one to attend the CrossFit football seminar? Uh, short answer is you can definitely retroactively. So here's, so, and we had another email. What, so I go to CrossFit football seminar. What can I do now? Okay. So let's just talk superficially. If you are CrossFit level one certified, you can then market yourself because you are licensed to use the term CrossFit, uh, in marketing yourself, your services, shit like that. You can market yourself as a CrossFit football coach and you can lead CrossFit football classes and, uh, put on CrossFit football camps, I guess. 
Uh, what you cannot do is put on any sort of CrossFit football seminars, right? Because we are the CrossFit football seminars. So if you're trying to do shit in your little AOR, your area of operation, and um, you're trying to call it a CrossFit football clinic or seminar, you're going to get stomped by the powers of B. Now, if you're not level one certified, you can't use those terms to market yourself. That's what the whole affiliate agreement is about. Well, that's not the whole thing, but that's what like the big perk of it is like, hey, I can now market my business, my coach, uh, my coaching and my classes as CrossFit. So if you don't have that level one, you can't use the CrossFit. You could say you have attended a CrossFit football seminar, um, which I don't know if people fucking dig, dig that or not, whatever. I mean, there's, but now let's talk deep meaning. You are going to be, provided with fucking pure uncut information roughly 20 hours of it just blasted like drinking from a fire hose all right you don't you can do whatever the fuck you want with that that new knowledge right so if you want to go start your own company called texas wadhard clinics you can do that and then but here's the thing don't be that guy who doesn't fucking say like oh man you know pay it back as you're paying it forward, those CrossFit football guys know their shit. So long story short is don't wait for your fucking level one. If it's in your area and you can make it, dude, get there. Uh, the information is the information, regardless of whether or not you're certified. Then as you get your level one, uh, if, that's in your, if that's in your coach's roadmap, then do it. Then you can start to, on your website, on your Twitter, on your Instagram, uh, on your Snapchat. You can then say and market yourself and your classes and your training as CrossFit football. Did I beat that fucking thing to death or what? Yeah, you can also use the hashtag CFFBeefQuake. Oh, yeah, that's right. Which uh, that you can only do that if you attend a seminar and get a shirtless hug from Tex. Um, but now while we're on the topic, kids, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing a little last minute. Uh, I guess by the time this airs, are we going to have Cali air this like next week? Yeah. Uh, but you're going to be like one day <laughs> away uh, from – we're doing a CrossFit football seminar at Power Athlete HQ in Newport Beach. Uh, that's going to be awesome because we're having it capped at 10 people, so it's going to be VIPs only. Uh, after that, we're going to our, our coach, Carl Case's gym in Mishwaka, Indiana, which is basically South Bend, Indiana. It's right by Notre Dame. So if you're in that area, go. Uh, then on that same weekend, we're planning on being up north and Je at Jesse Gray's gym, CrossFit Analog. Uh, probably going to drop in on Freddie and China just to see what they're up to. And then for international listeners of Power Athlete Radio, if you're in Amsterdam, if you're in Rome, if you're in Nuremberg, we're going to be there in September, uh, in the end of August. So check that sucker out. And then our boy who's going to Philly, that's October 15th. That's going to be five days after Luke. Turns 30, 82, 29, 34, Walter Payton, sweetness. So that's five days after my birthday. It's going to be a blast. Fucking great time. Anywho, so there's the CrossFit football shameless plugs and information. So what else we got, Tex? Uh, let's, let's stick with training. So a very CrossFit football pertinent question here. Here we go. This is from Sir Paul Kelly. Rugby players seem like football player builds, but run like soccer and lacrosse players. How would you train a rugby team versus a football, soccer, or lacrosse team? What is, like, if you're running like a lacrosse player or a soccer player, is that like cowardly running? What is that? Uh, dainty. Dainty. <laughs> yes. we, run dainty. Uh, we got these things called getaway sticks. Mm -hmm. So it's not the stick in our hand, it's our legs. Ah, I see. All right, so pontificate, Sir Tex. So first to your fellow Sir <laughs> Knighted Sir Paul Kelly. First and foremost, the only way to really get in shape for soccer, lacrosse, and football is to play soccer, lacrosse, or football. But there are different dif distances that we need to prepare for. Uh, so we kind of take this into consideration in our sprint, the Power Athlete Sprint Program. And this is something that John and I spend at, at length, length talking about and connected with uh, just, I guess, Charlie Francis's research. And that's where we develop kind of a, a special capacity approach. So this is where we can factor in set distances that your athletes are required to run. For football, it's, it's basically 10 to 60 yards. Anything outside of that, you're not necessarily going to be able to run in a straight line. Uh, for our soccer and lacrosse side of things, we go up on the upper end. So then we're, we're 60 to 120. And for some of our, our midfielder athletes, we even take that up to 180 yards. 
for rugby, you're probably going to be in that 60 to 120 range. That's the length of the field. That's the length of your breakaway. So you're going to be spending time replicating your top end speed in that. So other than that, the conditioning, will just, it would still apply a heavy art fast you would do for football, but they're only going to really get into rugby shape by playing soccer. So in the training perspective, what we can do You mean is, rugby shape by playing rugby? Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, Luke's got me. I'm just getting in the flow state here. <coughs> and Luke's taking me out. But. <laughs> All right. So in training, I'm not going to worry necessarily about conditioning. What we're going to do is put them in a position to survive rugby practice to prepare for their games. But what I can do is improve and increase their top end speed, so expand their abilities. Once we expand their abilities, then we can put them in a position to replicate their speed, their top end, their maximal velocity. And that's where we get into our special capacity training. So the weight training would be the same for football, soccer, lacrosse. Then the only thing that we would change are the distances that our athletes are training in. That's it. And then let conditioning really take care of itself during practice in the games. Final answer? Yeah. Beautiful. What else? So we got a question from Ty I like a lot. So our boy up um, Sacramento ways, I know he'll be at the seminar, August 20th, CrossFit Analog. So I have spent the last six months trying to teach cadets the basic athletic position, sprint drills, and basically how to move. There are more and more people coming to us with little to no body awareness. What would be the top five things that you would teach a new officer, firefighter, or other tactician about how to move and learn the agility necessary to do their daily job? Uh, dead bug. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of a loaded question because it's like, so Tyson, you should know this. I mean, it, it, for these guys, I don't know what the age, the, the age is here for these cadets. Like it's probably going to be well a, anywhere from 18 to fucking 40. Yeah. Right. So your younger athletes just based off of the fact that they're younger and still a little more adaptable have the, I guess, less reps to create bad habits. Um, you just got to get them on the program, man. They got to squat. They got to step. They got to lunge. Okay. So you got to build primal proficiency, right? So what is it? Text mobility, mobility, flexibility, mobility, stability. stability, primal proficiency, strength, power, speed, speed, replication of speed. Yeah. It's just that simple. And I mean, the demands are, are kind of that of a linebacker, you know, I mean, just to simplify it. So, you just got to get them on the program, dude, and they got to stick to it and they got to see the value in it. But like, I don't know if they do, man. I don't, you know, the psyche of a police officer, um, I don't know if they make the connections until they, it's like too late sometimes, or they have something happen to one of their, their friends or they see something on the news and it maybe fucking knocks, knocks some sense into them. They're like, dude, my body is as much as a weapon as, as my pistol or my baton or my taser. Right. And it's, it's just build that primal proficiency and then maximize power, strength, speed, right? And it's uh, it's something we talk about in terms of athleticism. And it fucking just kind of pisses me. Let me just tone it down a little bit. Let me cool cool my jets. It's kind of I'm kind of disappointed in people. Um, and I, when we talk to them about athleticism, you know, and it goes back to the Power Athlete Team Series, and and people are afraid to try to display athleticism because they know they're unathletic, right? And that's what's kind of cool about the fitness thing. And I'm not, listen, not knocking fitness. And I say this every time at the seminar, like I love that people want to be fit, but why don't people want to be athletic? You know, and we talk about our definition, which John needs to memorize because he's trying to get back on the cert staff, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the, the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine these primal movement patterns through space to complete a known or a novel task, right? And uh, I truly believe that like, as much as people benefit from fitness, people can benefit from the continual pursuit of athleticism. And the, the one thing that athleticism, I think, has over fitness is it is forever scalable. It is on a true continuum, meaning you can never be too athletic Meaning when we get to the two fit, we know the fitness sickness continuum, like go ahead. Spectrum. Spectrum. I'm sorry. Uh, spectrum from the level one. 
like we see it at the CrossFit Games. Like these people are fucking incredibly fit, and it, I'm not taking away from their training and their abilities. But it's getting to the point where the amount of stimulus and stress that it takes to display that level of fitness starts to work against you. And that's but that's indicative of any high level competitive sport. Yeah. Whether you're talking MMA, getting your face fucking smashed by Megan, uh, <laughs> or if you're talking about um, NFL, John, right? Ten years in the NFL, taking your body is taking a toll. But if you are not put in the competitive scenario and you are purely working on improving your ability to effortlessly and seamlessly combine these problem movement patterns through space, that goes on forever without any adverse consequences, right? And um, I, I don't know why people are scared of that. Like, is it because you look <laughs> like if you're not athletic, you look like shit? Like, yeah, you look bad. So they were trying to compare themselves to other people and that's where you fall. It's, and we, I guess we address this somewhat at the seminar during kind of when we introduce sprints and speed and we get to skipping and you think, oh, skipping, you know, people haven't done that, in, you know, since they were kids and then we have them do it and we, we have to call people out so we can use them as, as teaching examples for people to see with that they can't do a simple movement pattern like a skip. And so it's simple stuff. And then you see people kind of cower back to the back kind of. Uh, give us that body language where they're hunched over or the people are like shit I'm gonna get angry and do this correctly so they're just afraid to make a mistake they're afraid to look bad even though you know everybody's just in looking internally nobody's looking at you you just think they are anyways I honestly forgot what we were fucking talking about well uh, top five things you can give to uh, law enforcement oh. so here's here's the deal I can't give you a top five because it's gonna be different for every single freaking uh, uh, officer teaching a candidate out there, no matter what their firefighter or tactician, whatever it is, it's going to come down to communication. And when we say accelerated adaptation, you need to work on accelerated buy-in. So we are fortunate, Luke and I, and that we work with athletes. And if they don't listen to them, guess what? We're going to let them get hurt. And then we can afford that because they're going to come back to us and finally realize what we're trying to tell them from the get-go. And it's not a life-threatening thing. But if you're working with that, that military, the tactical officers, firefighters, those athletes, getting hurt could cost you a life, could cost you someone else's life. So you need to really sit down and not just freaking just try to beat it. Don't try to beat it into them. Communicate and make a connection based off everything that's going on right now. You can make a connection. I'm sure they have a, that kind of a empathy towards all the shit that's going on outside of your city, mm -hmm. maybe even in your city if you know something that happened. Make a connection to get on a buy-in. Show them. Don't just tell them so they can really take on everything you're trying to say because you're not their enemy. I mean, you're not necessarily their friend either, so you've got to find a walk that line between enemy and friend and get them to straight and narrow because it could be their life. It could be somebody else's. And if you're going to leave something on the table that could cost somebody else a life, then mm. I, I don't know if you're in the right profession. You know? Yeah, man, I, I, I don't know. So it's, it's going to be just sit them down. And focus on buy-in versus just a simple movement because we can't give you a movement mm -hmm. or five. All right, Tex, I'm going to just jump in on this one about our our man with the uh, elemental diet. We had a little back and forth here, Leia, between you and him. Um, so he's asking us, how does someone up their protein intake if they are on an elemental diet, right? Ella Care Jr. Unflavored. Uh, I'm assuming it's a branding. Um, and can't digest protein unless it's broken down to where all the body has to absorb it, right? So this kind of – then, Leah, we were a little confused on this, right? So then you kind of bounce right. back uh, just for a little more info um, and, you know, asking for why the heck are you doing this and are you only eating liquids or what's the deal? And he said uh, – Fuck. Do you have this in front of you? Because this, yeah, is like, yeah. you he read has, this. I don't know what any of this is. Right. He has eosinophilic esophagitis disease, so it's an inflammatory disease of the esophagus, um, and he's. But he's also got some issues with protein digestion. So, uh, layman's terms, the dude's having trouble. First of all, eating regular food like swallowing the esophagus, it gets inflamed and there your throat gets inflamed. And then he's also having trouble actually digesting any of the protein that he would take in. Um, so really extreme kind of special case. 
But the problem is, is when you can't digest your food, you get really malnourished, obviously. And um, so he's, his body was having pr- trouble producing enough HGH or testosterone. Uh, he was put on the elemental diet and he started to have some uh, positive impact with that, but he still takes some exogenous testosterone. So he was wondering if this was anything that we maybe could help him with or help him tackle as far as increasing that protein intake. So the basic deal with that is, is we, we work with a lot of different people, um, but our recommendations are generally for people that aren't suffering from a lot of different, um, say, you know, diseases or, or, um, you know, problems. But that being said, this might be something that we could work with. We've had a few special populations. Um, you know, I worked with John to help a patient that we had or a, or a client that we had who had a lot of thyroid issues. We managed to get some great success with her. So we, we may, well, you know, Jay, what is it? Jay Goldstrom. We'll, uh, we'll look for your email um, and we'll go uh, touch base with you and see if this is something that we might be able to, to work with you on. But just in general, you know, the outlier population, um, I mean, I am, a, I am a, a nurse. I work in a functional medicine um, office part-time. So I do see my fair share of a lot of autoimmune diseases and things like that. And I've got some great resources on how to deal with those. Um, but again, we just got to get all the, all the details to really find out if this is something that we're going to want to tackle. So be on the lookout for that. Jay Goldstrom, I don't know what your real name is because it's not in your Instagram page. I hate it when people don't put a description of themselves. Anonymity. You want to stay, I mean, you just want to be, you want to be the person that you post, not the person you are. That's true. But there are pictures of his dog on Instagram. So we're automatically best friends, (laughs) obviously. So I think we could probably do something with this. All right. Well, let's, uh, thanks, Leah. Let's volley back to the training side of things. And something that was pretty cool because at the games, we didn't have a booth, but we helped at the form lifting booth. Um, go for it, Tex. Do you have any tips on using the form collar? Yeah. <laughs> this is Nolan. I was a Kickstarter contributor and picked up my collar at the game. Sick. Do you have any principles for using it for building strength? Oh, definitely. For building muscle? Uh, I've used it twice so far. And it looks like I'm very a very slow mover. That's not good. My current goal is to build muscle for two months and then work on strength or maybe a two to three month block. Unless you have ideas for doing both at the same time, I'm just a construction worker who likes getting stronger and working out. <sighs> okay. So let's just kind of break this down a little bit. First off, form collar. Uh, we've been helping these guys put together the training application side of their product, which is that the product is a collar that uses all sorts of fancy electronics to send data to your phone to give you like these metrics about your lifts. Uh, and basically we, and we got some notes on the whiteboard now because we were just on a pretty long call yesterday. Um, but here's what you need to do, bro. Um, and here's what's going to eventually be packaged up for you. So, you're going to take your primary lifts that you hit. I don't know what your programming is like. If you're following our programming, I would suggest your squat and your power clean uh, to start. And you're going to have to build a baseline, right? Um, and what we're thinking right now is just working up approximately 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90%, hitting a triple for a couple sets and trying to establish your fastest lift, at those percentages and then write that sucker down in a notebook and uh, you're going to use those numbers to, to basically auto-regulate your movement. So if you're hitting, if the program is calling for something that's in that 70% range, you're not going to look at weight anymore. You're going to start to move the weight at the speed that you hit at that 70%. So load the bar up with whatever you are because ultimately what we're doing by moving the bar faster, and this is what I was trying to tell people at the CrossFit Games. And this, if you go back and listen to Hatfield's podcast, one, it's one of my favorite podcasts that we've had. Um, but basically, the, the more force that you produce into a bar, the faster it's going to go. The faster it goes, the more motor recruitment you get through line of action, range of motion. The more motor recruitment you get, the higher level of training response, or no, training stimulus. What, stimulus thank you, Tex. Uh, the higher level of training stimulus, 
you get. The higher training stimulus, the more potent training response. So this is a whole cascading pipeline for maximizing performance, right? And, and it just gives you now, um, it gives you another, like, for me, I'm not intimidated by this, but it gives you another number to chase, another number to monitor, right? It's more data. And it, it gives you meaningful data because weight is only meaningful if you can contextually understand the purpose of adding weight to the bar. You're going to get stronger with more motor recruitment. The stronger you are, the heavier weights you can lift. The heavier weights you can lift, the more the larger cross-sectional density will be required of the muscle to support the load, whether it's uh, on your back or in your hands through that kinetic chain. The more cross-sectional density, the more muscle you have. So I know like in your head, you're trying to quote unquote build muscle. But remember that form follows function, okay? And what I mean by this is if you wanna get jacked, do things that require jackedness to do. Did I say that right, Tex? Yeah. Specific adaptation to impose demands. Yeah. So just basically, if you can, if you can build this matrix, and we're going to be working with the form team to put this in the app to build your your uh, baseline, and then work off of that, um, you should be moving. Uh, I'm going to butcher these numbers, but listen, if you, and maybe we'll uh, get these numbers out for you. Um, exactly, because this is can't, this comes from some research that John was doing with some really smart fucking people on this velocity based stuff. But for your power lifts, uh, if let's say you're going to be uh, I think your circa max should be 0.3 meters per second, and that's going to be 80 to 90%. And then basically every 10% down from there is like another uh, uh, 0.15 meters per second. So it goes 0.35, 0 0.3, 0 0.45, 0 0.6, 0 0.75, 0.8, or something like that. Maybe Jason I got it backwards. Needs. But basically move the bar as fast as possible. And and the numbers are just going to be a guideline anyways based off these percentages because based off of your skill level and your mechanical efficiency and the amount of reps you have under the bar, that's going to dictate whether or not you're going to, uh, you're going to be able to, to speed the bar up. Now, another thing, I guess, getting into even more, uh, you know, maybe you'll remember the terminology text, but is the idea that let's say we have a, a novice lifter, and that's not a bad thing. It just means literally you haven't developed an adaptation of a train lifter, okay? And you should chase that. But if you were to look, at, let's say at 85%, you throw on a weight, all right? Uh, and you hit five reps. And let's say your, your bar speed is increasing as the reps go on. What does that mean, Tex? You remember, what's the term that we were talking about yesterday? Term is escaping me, but... If you are in, it's intramuscular coordination. So right. it's going to be, no, it's, that's going to be pattern encoding. So if your pattern encoding increases later reps, so if we're doing a set of five, gradually from one, two, three, four, five, you get faster and faster, more efficient in your movement. You are clearly a novice athlete. Mm -hmm. And as you see that table turn over your training life cycle, which it eventually will, and it's not a bad thing, just understand that central nervous system efficiency is increasing, which is a good thing, and now your faster reps are gonna be occurring in reps one, two, three of five, and then five is gonna slow down, right? Um, all this is a lot of information, but basically what you need to do is consciously move the bar as fast as possible at a given weight relative to your 1RMs, okay? Write that number down, and then always try to move it faster next time you hit it, right? So attack those speed corridors with whatever weight you can throw on the bar, and some days you're gonna have it, some days you're not. But as long as you're moving fast, you are getting motor recruitment and you're maximizing it, right? So that's what we're gonna be looking for. Yeah, and this is, this is all from an athlete's perspective. So great question and answer, uh, but kind of hanging out with the form caller for three, four days and actually observing athletes use this stuff and uh, see the numbers in your hand, which is pretty cool. I was thinking how could this be applied for a coaching tool? And then how can I carry this over to a freaking a weight room? So 40 athletes, right? A team, depending on the team we're working with. Uh, so number one is going to be a, a coach's eye. So I'm going to have this immediate feedback. So I'm going to observe the speed of the bar. And then you can start to connect what you see in an instant with a number associated with it. So this is something uh, I, I try to get away from the, the coach's eye video, that app and try to really practice just seeing it as quickly as possible. But as a young coach, I would record it. 
uh, and then make my mental notes at full speed and then slow it down and see how quickly I'd be able to. So now instead of a video, this is going to be a, a velocity coach's eye tool that anybody can use and really, you know, accelerate your coaching education. And second is going to be, as Luke talked about, the, the training life cycle and identifying it because athletes are going to lie to you. So if they, you know, played four years of high school football and they're getting you as a freshman, they say, yeah, I lift weights. I know what I'm doing. And maybe it looks pretty good, but then they're not fast or they're leaving kind of speed on the table. This is a tool to be able to, you know, give immediate feedback to you as a coach, you as an, uh, or your athlete and uh, kind of see what level they are, novice versus trained. Uh, and as more people, high schoolers get experience with kind of CrossFit training or uh, more educated high school football coaches, at the college level, this is going to be necessary, and you want to put the right program at the right time, and if you misapply a program, you're going to decrease your athlete's trainability. And we only have four years with an athlete, which is not a lot of time. You need to hit the right program at the right time. So this is a great tool to really test that beyond the numbers. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess to give you more, just because I know we're hammering this, and that's what our specialty, but... Um, even if you're not, if you're like going for an, a hypertrophy or whatever, and you're you're doing higher reps, I don't know what programming you're following, man. Um, just track your lifts, get a feel for what your speed is, and uh, you know, it's it's going to be a valuable coaching tool. And then when, as you go into maybe more of a power, like anything sub max, well, you should be moving as fast as possible. So I'll say this: with hypertrophy training, recovery is huge. So this tells you your central nervous system efficiency. Those move the dirt days. It'll tell you when you're, you're moving like shit, even though you feel great, but your speed isn't there, then you're not going to drive the right adaptation. You're actually going to do yourself a, a disservice, especially with hypertrophy training. So it'll tell you days to really push and move, and then days, hey, you need a recovery day. Not a form day, you need a recovery day. Mm -hmm. All right, what do we got? We got a fun one. All right, Tyler, are you ready? Are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. How many miles per day Doing a farmer's carry, did it take you to get your long, luscious arms? That's verbatim. <laughs> We're going to need an answer, Tyler. Oh, man. That's uh, beings weighing anywhere from 170 to 185 up and putting them down. Oh, yeah? That's it? it yeah, you, you, it was, it was yeah, by, all the... If I put them down, do you mean just pick them up and just let them hang there until your arms? Are I mean, I mean, picking them up, tilting them from twelve o'clock to six o'clock, and dumping them back down on their head. <laughs> so you got to go beat some fucking wholesale ass to stretch those bad. Yes, well, that's how go, that, that's that's how that's how you become seventy-two inches with a seventy-six inch reach. That's that's the way, and a little kyphosis helps. Jay, I'll, I'll tell you how you do the exact opposite for <laughs> the short. <laughs> fucking uh what would you call these dents i'll call them dense armed they're all right they're meat, hairy meat packed arms you just bench every day for 1500 days in a row and that'll shorten your arms <laughs> it's called ice <laughs> yeah fucking high school football in texas all right so here's here's one for i guess maybe the crew um nutrition tips while traveling around europe for four weeks I want to enjoy oh. myself, but also not come back feeling like a piece of shit. Dude, I, I've, I've been to Europe and experienced every like way to do nutrition there. Um, number one, so I did one week, the first time I ever went, and the goal was to just walk everywhere that I could and eat like – a tourist, but eat at all the real good places and not worry about my diet whatsoever. Don't work out for a week. And I dropped like a little under two pounds. Like it was ridiculous. Like I had no stomach issues. Um, <laughs> the reason being is because the food quality is so amazing. Um, but at the same time too, like my standard of what is considered bad food is still probably a little bit higher than the traditional standard. Um, but then every other time I've gone, I've really just... I just kind of kept it fairly simple. Um, meat is kind of hard to come by in American level quantities in Europe. Uh, so I always just did my best to, to get whatever meal had the most meat in it. 
I would always try to choose something with like the best quality carbs. Potatoes aren't really hard to come by in Europe whatsoever. Uh, I walked as much as I could. If I could get a workout in, I'd get a workout in. I slept as much as I possibly could. Uh, made you know made sure that the room was pitch black, things like that. But man, I've I've never like I said I've done a little bit of everything. But it's it's for me it's always been easier to do it there than it is here. Leah, any uh, any tips? Um, well, unfortunately, I've only been to Europe once. I actually went uh, a long time, 2009. I actually went to Israel with the USA Maccabi team, volleyball team, which is kind of like the Jewish Olympics, except for we weren't that good. But I went and played over there, and we were there for about um, six weeks which doesn't really count because we were training and they fed us and kept us in like kind of dorms or whatever. But after that, I went to Paris for a couple of weeks with my family and kind of like Tyler said, I didn't actually have a lot of issues as far as feeling terrible because we walked everywhere. I think people really um, forget or just because it's not a part of uh, American culture as much, I guess, that your non-exercise uh, mediated thermogenesis, I think is what they call it, uh, like the calories you burn just doing activity that's not related to exercise is so much higher when you have to walk everywhere. You don't really think about it as, as you know, like I'm working out, but it made a big difference as far as like how you feel you know, you go eat lunch and you're not going to eat a giant, well, most of us, I guess, wouldn't because you know you got to walk five miles back to the hotel or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, I didn't really have a lot of issues and I spent most of my time cause we were there for 10 days. I think we didn't try and eat quote unquote healthy. We did, we wanted to eat the good food. I, I had rabbit, which was delicious, tasted like chicken. Um, and it was in a pot of mashed potatoes that probably had more butter than potato in it. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't really have any trouble, um, as far as feeling good. I guess I would say like, make sure you keep your activity out, you know, walk everywhere and, and, um, you know, don't stuff your face. That's probably the easiest <laughs> tip. Um, but I don't, I don't know. You only get to go to one respect. Don't be weird. You only get to go on European vacations. I would assume every once so every couple of months. Yeah. Well, for you, <laughs> that's not a vacation, but anyway, so it, you got to enjoy yourself a little bit. A lot of it. A lot of it. We did so, drink a fair amount of wine. Yeah. I mean, like you guys said, like mostly through Europe, you're going to be able to find some sort of meat and veggie. Right. And then, um, look outside the box too. That's a, I mean, to kind of get an opportunity. Like, um, Tyler said, like, I don't, I've never had, rabbit anywhere else like good pick some weird stuff just to yeah. try it out why not you're there as many species as possible is that drink coffee everywhere yeah yes, and, coffee was so good and oh, don't put anything in it no yeah. it was amazing french coffee ugh. well yes uh, we got we got some tips first and foremost is eat as many species as possible in a, in a single sitting mm -hmm. i think our record is what 150 <laughs> not in a single sitting with that place in South Africa. Yeah, but that was the 150 species, Tex. Well, it was a lot of species. It was maybe 10. On each kebab. And we had five <laughs> kebabs. Okay. Uh, then pack jerky. Just the travel, don't eat the airplane food. Yep. Don't do it. That's how you're going to feel like the most shit is eating airplane food. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got, we, I'd rather eat expired well food code, but... Um, Second is uh, Luke and I have developed an unjam you up protocol. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't require a lot of weight. So think of a, a big squat that's a move, movement pattern you've done an infinite amount of times. So you need to do a lot of them at a heavy weight, right, to drive your adaptation. So in order for you to get the same central nervous system stimulus, you need to do new movements through different planes of motion, and you can accomplish the same amount of stress and hype with a lower weight. Mm -hmm. So that could be a kettlebell or it could be a fucking rock. I don't know where you're traveling to. Uh, but what Luke and I do, we twist, we bend, we get out of our comfort zone, we reach deep into the freaking League of Shadows bag of tricks and just try to really have fun. 
and that's that's almost adding weight to all of our warm-ups. So we, I love the center mass bells that we got from from Sorenex because it forces us to really be creative and outside the box versus typical swings. Uh, but twist, jam, uh, what else we got with that? Um, also, I, I would say when we go out, warm beer. Is that you guys? Warm beer is going to do the trick. <clears throat> So in, uh, in Texas, Leia, you can appreciate this. Warm beer, we just simply call Cowboy Cold. Yeah. So it's a posit positive spin on things. And uh, whether that's in Germany, whether that's in, in freaking Ireland, we've always found an appreciation for whether it's cider, beer, uh, or wine, and getting into it. So kick back and, and enjoy the locals. Instead of following, uh, following Google, what we do is either ask uh, our gym. We're fortunate enough to have you know gym people lead us around, or we just go to a bar and talk to a bartender. They live there forever, and it's like, uh, what What would you want to do in your last weekend in this town, wherever it may be? And they usually point us in the right direction. So in terms of food, drinks, experiences, checking shit out that's that's freaking on the, the seedy underbelly belly of these cities, uh, that's that's what I would recommend is, you know, connect with the bartender, have a, have a cowboy cold, and uh, pack as much jerky as you can last just in case. Anything to add, guys? Don't be weird. Don't be weird. All right, all right, all right. What are the questions we got? Anything coming in late? I had one on creatine. Um, uh, five grams. Or well, I, I got it. You got it? You got it? Right. Yeah, listen up. <clears throat> Thoughts on the standard recommended dosage of five grams creatine mono? Should more only be added for larger body mass, or could people under 200 pounds benefit from more? I know more isn't always better, but I saw some recent articles posted about upping the dose. Yes. So there's been tests done on people like to tr creatine used to treat depression, creatine used just for cognitive functioning, athletes. It's, in my opinion, the best supplement. It, I think we've only like broken the surface on how important creatine is. And it's going to be like the next thing that they're telling everyone you should just take. It's like the new multivitamin, but uh, 20 grams. It's one of those things like for therapeutic purposes, they're giving it and way excess of that. I'm a fan of, if you are doing that especially, use pure creatine monohydrate. Don't do any of the crap that's loaded with sugar. Don't mix it with sugar. Um, don't do anything like that. But there's just no evidence out there to support that doing higher doses is going to have negative or dangerous effect. So that being said, don't make this a contest to see if you can flirt with that line. Uh, but I, I'm a big fan of... of anywhere between like the, the 10 to 20 grams, uh, depending on, on like your level of activity and activity and your size. And I've experimented, I've experimented <laughs> on, on my own too. So I've, I've, I have noticed differences in the 10 to 20 between that and doing just five. I take five. Uh, what you think about that, Tyler? Is that enough for me? Uh, for a I'm chick? A, I'm like 160 pounds. Yeah. For, for, for a lady, a, for a lady, for a, for a, for a, a more for a beautiful muscular, woman, mother of our planet, obviously for a more muscu muscularly endowed female such as yourself. I'm a little bit beefier. Than um, many. Yeah, I think five is like a bare bones minimum for someone who's doing your kind of training. I would probably experiment and go closer to like seven to ten and see how you, see if you notice anything. I can do that easy. Um, easy, easy. Thirty days. Yeah, thirty days. You know how it is. Don't ever. You know we get these people. But, you know, like I tried it for a week. It just didn't do it for me. I so, tried it for five days and I tried this diet and my six pack isn't showing yet. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Give, well, it, give it a good 30 days. See if you know. This will be the Leia creatine experiment. There we go. I'll let you know how it goes. There we go. Asked and answer people. You guys, you nutrition gurus ready for another one? It's lengthy. Get your pens and pencils out. Paper, I guess. Um, here we go. Currently following the hybrid athlete uh, power ath powerlifting marathon template. No clue what that is, but I assume it's running and lifting, which we can talk it's about. Stupid. That. Oh, sorry. Uh, Wait. We can <laughs> we can talk about the efficacy and approach to that in a bit, but it's a nutrition question. So he's lifting four days a week and running five days. Uh, trained first thing in the morning. Currently in a fasted state, with the majority of my carbs coming later in the day. Energy strength and running are currently increasing. Uh, energy level seems to tank only on the long, slow runs on day six of training. 
Uh, currently weighing 194, but would love to drop 10 pounds over a six week period. Wondering if shifting the majority of carbs to the post workout two hour range would be helpful if the goal is to lose some weight. Yes, 100%. I mean, there's, yes, 100%. There's, there's really like no reason that you wouldn't, in, you know, see benefits from putting it more toward that time, especially if you're using quality. You know, like we, we have people sometimes who will do something totally opposite of what we would recommend and they say it works. Uh, a lot of the times I find that that's just more a determining factor of their, their um, like how long they, their, their experience level. They're still in that novice phase. So kind of anything they do, they're still going to get some really good benefits from it. Um, especially if it was just better than what they were doing to begin with. But if you're trying to lose weight and perform, um, you know, form follows function, I, I just I can't see any reason why you would want your carbs necessarily completely later in the day. I could, I could see a reason for putting post and later in the day just to fuel you for that next early morning workout. Uh, but I would definitely spread them out a little bit more evenly. Now, I know I'm not on the uh... – I'm not the nutrition guru, but a little click through on House Rat's account and a little flick of the, the finger and scroll through to look at some of these pictures. Here's another fucking um, novel idea for you, bro. Stop fucking eating Cinnabons and donuts and cake. How about that? How about you, uh, you know, strap it up, focus on food quality, and you're going to fucking melt away weight if you just stop eating this shit. Now, Maybe you're the guy. You're just like, man, I just take pictures of this. I don't even eat it. I'm like all those Instagram babes who pretend to eat pizza. But um, uh, if, if you're asking us for our nutrition advice, first and foremost, the, the base of the pyramid is food quality. And that's, I mean, that's that. Now, we have our don't be weird clause. But if you're crushing donuts while you're trying to lose weight, I think you're doing it wrong. Now, Leah, Tyler, you, of course, feel free to correct me. Um, but I don't know if you want to go into that a little bit. Well, yeah. I mean, you got to look at your goals. Uh, our don't be weird clause is, is basically like a lifestyle claw. I mean, you know, if you are got a goal though, I got, I got six weeks and I want to drop 10 pounds, then you got to put the donut down. It's not going to help you. It's just going to make it harder. Um, if you were just like, you know, I just want to perform better. Maybe didn't have a set goal on what you know, you wanted to have done then. Okay. Maybe you have a little more leeway within your diet. Still, obviously we're not proponents of just crushing donuts constantly, but, um, you've got a specific goal that you're aiming for and you know, you got to buckle down to try and get there. Well, exactly. it, it is weird. And, and, it, it, it is weird. If you have a goal and you're not doing everything in your power to accomplish it, that's mm -hmm. fucking weird. Well, that's because we're performance scores and we're, we want to outperform everybody no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> And just in case, just in case, like you are falling, and even if you're not, it still gives me a chance to, to complain about this. If you are for some reason following like the, if it fits your macros top format, because there's a lot of people doing that, uh, first and foremost, don't do that. It's terrible. Uh, so what you have is we have some of like the best CrossFit athletes in the world are, are, are hashtagging the if it fits your macros, all this, and they only hashtagging it for their crappy food that they post. So what you're not seeing is these people, you know, are oftentimes eating really good quality food and they're already at this level of, of a super lean body mass. They're high performers. Um, but then every now and then they're going to eat something bad and just to make you think, oh my gosh, how are they getting by with that? Um, you know, they'll hashtag that. So it leads people to think you can get by with that all the time. You just simply can't. Like it's, it's, it's not going to happen. It just doesn't work. And I think that that's, um, some brilliant marketing with that world. And a lot of the people who are marketing it that way, don't, they're not intending to. They're just you know, trying to get some attention on their social media when they, when they do something that, that just looks like it shouldn't, this person with those kind of abs shouldn't be eating this way. And we, you know, what's interesting too, Tyler, is um, you know, we were talking to Matt Reynolds, who works with, um, works with Rip Ito and uh, starting strength guy. And Rip used to be a low bar guy. And you know, it's like you give people an inch and somehow they end up going a mile. And he's like, we don't use the term low bar anymore. Uh, they actually use the spine of the scapula as a, a landmark. And it's like, you know, people tend to, like, it's not intent. And maybe, I guess I'm giving people benefit of the doubt too. Like some of these nutrition gurus who are like promoting a potential if it fits your macros, you know, maybe the intent is to be like, hey, there's a little bit of flexibility here. Like be an adult, 
be accountable. But if you're, you just make sure you're staying within that macro radius and you shouldn't derail. Like maybe that's the message. But what people hear is like, I'm going to jam one dozen donuts yeah. with jam, <laughs> with jam into my mouth right now. And then they go fucking ham because it fits their macros. But uh, yeah. But, while we got you guys fired up on nutrition text, let's get this other one and while, while Tyler and Leia are up from their naps. All right, Jack, Jack 67 writes, protein timing and doses. I feel like you touched on this recently, so maybe beat to death and a million answers, but I would appreciate you helping me sort it out, exclamation point. Looking at body weight of 260 pounds, should protein be based off of lean body weight or overall? I am training three times a week, squat, bench press, then strongman events, then deadlift and overhead press. I one run of four to five miles on the weekend, training for overall strength and conditioning, and trying to change body comp slowly. Should protein be slowly over the day to total or more time to approach around training times? Thanks for the great opportunity, and I appreciate all of you guys go <laughs> awesome well first you want protein throughout the day every meal um i don't ever see a reason why a meal wouldn't contain protein necessarily um so you definitely want to spread it out as far as um putting it towards your lean body mass you know there's the way i kind of explain to people if we do that then where are we getting the rest of our calories um because you're probably going to, you know, you're going to be eating more calories than what you think you should be eating away. Um, and that's one thing that we than they used to eat and they're losing, they're losing weight and performing like crazy. But if we kept your protein right at just, just your lean body mass, you're going to be so low on calories from protein. You're going to have to just binge it in somewhere else. Um, so the, the, that was kind of a long answer. The short answer is no, do not take it off of your lean body mass, take it off of your body mass and probably do more than just how much you weigh. Um, you know, it's, it's, if you're just, you know, like some of my MMA athletes and things like that will drop their protein down just cause they need tons of carbs. So, you know, we can, we can sacrifice a little bit of the protein, but for his goals, I think, uh, his body weight is like a bare minimum of protein he's feeding. Lay anything else to jump on there? Uh, no, not really. I mean, Tyler pretty hit it. I, I think I see that with a lot of the athletes that I deal with too, um, especially the girls. They don't. They. I mean, I've never gotten a a girl client that has been eating enough protein, honestly. Um, and a lot of them don't spread it out appropriately. So, and it's easy. I can see it's kind of hard, um, sometimes to make sure that you're balancing it out, especially in the morning if you're not a big breakfast person, but making sure that the protein is spread throughout the day, a makes it easier to hit your goal so that you're not just stuffing your face at night for missed, uh, protein. But then it, it really helps as far as, um, you know, keeping your hunger at bay protein is very satisfying and, um, you know, just helping with overall performance and, and building strength, building muscle. Boom. Asked and answered. Now we got a little mixed bag question, a little bit to do with like, what are you training for, for us coaches, our abilities, <laughs> and then what we would recommend for, for our man Ziegs. So go ahead. All right. So Ziegler. Which power athlete headquarters coach could hunt down a bear, kill it, cook it, and eat it the fastest? I guess he's assuming we're all going to succeed. This is awesome. Uh, JK, but seriously. As a PE teacher, would you recommend having a larger breakfast to burn throughout the day until lunch or have the larger lunch and have some fast, fasted morning? My curriculum is strength and conditioning based with the power athlete methodology. I've trained field strong. With, for my college alumni game each year, as well as vacation. Real goals, to squat 405 pounds, deadlift 500, and press my body weight. Eventually, in eight years, would love to represent Power Athlete at the CrossFit Games qualifier in the Masters division. Jeff. So why don't we just go ahead and tackle the bear question first? All right. I think that I'm going to win solely based on my speed of eating abilities. Speed of eating. So, but that's not the, well, that's, that, that helps. Ah, well, all right. 
So but I have actually killed a bear. I have actually killed a bear okay. and cleaned and gutted and ate said bear. Now, but you were probably fucking put out a little bait trap and sat in a tree stand. No, and, uh, like a, that is totally illegal. No, you, dude, I you go chased out, him. Yeah, I go out in naked. The mountains. I go out naked in the woods and I just bring a fucking a six inch blade and I, I fight it. I bear fight it. Well, I've been studying the revenant <laughs> and predator. So here's my strategy: is basically take myself <laughs> become a, a part of the environment, and then just sneak attack during hibernation. So I don't even have to worry about the fight. Ooh, see, tax that's smart, dude. Hibernation and, hunt, and then I'm going to take my sweet ass time while y'all are fighting the bears to mm. then gut it, cook it up, and eat it. Because I mean, I'm a slow eater. Oh my god, it's unbearable. I can't. I mean, I can't bear it. I can't even bear it. It's unbearable. Uh, and yet it? he, he ends up coming late to like every time you're supposed to meet him to eat mm -hmm. breakfast or lunch he's like 15 fucking minutes late and then yeah, he eats, takes forever to eat yeah. ridiculous what's your problem we can't bear to hear any more about this i get my mind right yeah. now. <laughs> one i'm a thinker so i have to mentally prepare myself for the flow state in which it's called eight hours at the crossfit football seminar each day mm -hmm. you know that you understand but the mental process it takes to get in the zone to talk be dehydrated, hungry for eight hours. That, that's a lot. I know it's a lot for you, but I'm always in the zone. Always. Never not in the zone. So I think we've all... Leah, do you even know how to eat a bear? I have, I have cleaned a, a deer, not oh, a bear. I didn't actually go. kill it, but I cleaned it and gutted it and cut all the meat off, and that was fun. Yeah, there you go. So I think you're in the, you're in the race, too. I think there's really... Uh, honestly, I, I hate to say it, but I don't know if we can answer this question. And what we will do is test it. Is test it, and everybody will be dropped. Test it. We'll go over to Tyler's, go in his huge backyard, and we'll just get dropped in with a weapon of our choice, and then we'll see who eats the bear first. It's not that complicated. Leah, this one's for you. <laughs> Would you recommend having a larger breakfast to burn throughout the day until lunch or having a larger lunch and have a, a somewhat fasted morning? I'm not a huge fan of fasting, honestly. I think that most people are not as fat adapted as they need to be, meaning their body runs really efficiently off of fat to perform well. And I'm not just talking about perform like activity wise, but like mentally, mental clarity, things like that. If you're teaching um, on a, in a fasted state, there are, there are definitely people that can do it. Um, but there's, honestly not a lot of people that do it well so i'm not a huge fan of being fast in the morning i think having a um it doesn't have to be your biggest meal but like having a substantial breakfast is is more beneficial but that's just my personal thoughts on it yeah dude i mean like e even like I don't, I don't know if it's a time thing i don't know what's up but like even like a little bit of like greek yogurt some protein powder a little bit of oatmeal or something like just to fucking kind of get the get the the fire burning right yeah, I mean, I like I like to personally, unless you're working out in the morning, I like to personally keep my carbs a little bit lower um, in the morning, and unless I know I'm not going to get food for a long time, um, because I feel like I run a little bit better. You don't get that insulin spike, but yeah, I mean, you gotta you gotta go for something. All right, so we're gonna end on a fun one here. So this should take about fifteen twenty good minutes to debate, Luke. But today is Arnold Schwarzenegger's birthday. What are y'all's favorite quotes and movie of the man? Favorite quotes, plural, or quote and movie, like combined? I think it's two different questions. All right. Well, who wants to go first? Leia, are you ready? Don't say I mean, kindergarten cop. <laughs> Oh, that is a good one. It's yeah, not a Juma. It's not my it's answer. Not a I'm super generic with this one. I mean, I'm a big fan of the come with me if you want to live. And especially since he's made those new t-shirts. Have you seen the Arnold t-shirt? Yeah, for sure. Come with me if you want to lift. Yeah. Oh, I got to buy one, oh, some of that shit. Great. It's Arnold great. It is numero uno. <laughs> yes. So I, I, think, I think that's one of my favorites. So you're going kindergarten cop and come with me. No, no, that wasn't kindergarten cop. That was Terminator. No, I understand uh, that's your quote, oh, but what okay. about the movie? My favorite. Actually, I like Terminator 2. T2? Oh, good choice. Yeah, T2. Not, yeah, that one's my favorite. All right. 
Pretty good choices there, Leah. I have to say, approved. Uh, what do you, Google's, or fucking Texas Googling it? I'm just feeling, thinking, I got, my, I got my answers written down. I'm just Twins. Kidding. Texas has twins standing next to John Wilborn. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> can we take, can we recreate go? the cover to that? <laughs> That'd be a good Call one. Call John. That'd be a good one. I, we do have matching clothes. Um, Tyler, how's your there? connection? Yes. To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of the women. There you go. Fucking Conan. And then what about movie? A favorite? Probably Conan. Um, I don't know, man. That one or, or Predator? I'm like, Predator is just... Predator is the shit. That's just one of the best movies ever. So are you going Predator? Let's go, let's go Predator just to mix it Fuck. Up. Okay, so that was mine. Yes. Um, but I will go to my next one, which I know text you're jotting down now, but is legitimately my fucking next favorite Arnold movie. Yes. Ah, oh, True Lies. Great. Fucking true Lies is good. And then I'd have to say my favorite. So back in college, this is like, um, fuck, what year would that be? Like 2000, uh, 2003, 2002, 2003. I fucking went on a rampage of prank calling with the Arnold soundboard. Oh, nice. So you, there used to be like a web page where you would you could uh, push buttons and it would be like, it, it was basically a soundboard and you would try to like hold fucking carry um, conversations with people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, dude, it fucking went on a rampage. But I have to say because of that, so there's a little bit of nostalgia. It's not necessarily the movie quote, but it is who is your daddy and what does he do? Like without a doubt, kindergarten cop. <laughs> Uh, have you guys seen the, this was a long time ago, where they did the, the Arnold's Pizza Shop? Yes, dude. That's, that, oh, my God. That's like 10 years ago. I, I still will listen to this and fucking be in tears. Yeah. Well, we're, we're You've called list. Arnold's Pizza Arnold's Shop. Arnold's Pizza Shop. <laughs> All we have is pepperoni and bullets on your pizza. Nine millimeter bullets on your pizza. <laughs> <laughs> fucking awesome. Uh, I, so I'm torn. I, I, got, I got three written down here that I, I just can't, can't live without. First one is is True Lies solely by, because of Tom Arnold though. Mm -hmm. Tom Arnold is an amazing guy. Yeah, he is. So the favorite line from that is going to be, "She took the ice cube trays out of the freezer." <laughs> what kind of <laughs> sick bitch does that? Uh, so but that's he, Tom Arnold. I know. That's why it's that's why I'm crossing it out. <laughs> okay. Second, sixth day sleeper pick. Great, great, just sci-fi action, but it is only set up because of my number one Total Recall. 1990 so an amazing just fucking tail and twist of action gunfire and fucking science fiction mm -hmm. oh man it's amazing so just uh that's going to be my movie and then i'm taking a quote from that and it's definitely on the side of uh, the soundboard when he's simply just come on don't bullshit me <laughs> <laughs> that's my best arnold it's pretty it wasn't that bad so there you go that's the answer happy birthday arnie yeah douglas quaid is that it? Is that a rap text? That's that's a rap. But I mean, over, we can't. But Predator's so good. I think Predator is up there, dude. Predator has that good quote too, where he says, "What the fuck are you?" And he says, "What the fuck are you?" And yeah. the handshake. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dylan. Pushing pencils. What's the wrong CIA? Have you pushing to me pencils? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that is fucking solid. Oh, we got to um, end on that then. All right. Well, Leia, Tyler, have a great weekend, man. Hey, Tyler, give Megan a big, uh, big hug and a chest bump from us and a fake headbutt. Um, um, uh, Leia, take care. Awesome that your event went off, and we'll talk to you guys sooner than later, right? All right. Awesome, guys. You got it. Bye. 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 Now it's time for you to empower your performance. Yes, it is that time. Wade's Army's fifth annual Wade's Day campaign has officially kicked off. From now until November 12th, we will be honoring the brave pediatric cancer patients battling neuroblastoma, a tumor derived from immature nerve cells. For 2016, we're embracing their valor and highlighting their nerves of steel. Join the fight against neuroblastoma and help us reach our goal of fundraising $125,000. Enlist today at wadesarmy.org by clicking the Donate Now badge and claim your limited edition Wade's Army uniform. Every army needs a uniform. Until next time, bye!